Well, it's a great honor to be here, in particular to uh, speak in honor of uh, Sergei uh, uh, on his 60th birthday, it's, um, and in front of such a distinguished audience. Um, I uh, have known Sergei for a, a long time, and we've been on many program committees together, and in fact, we'll be on another one in the fall. And I'm looking forward very much to, to our always interesting discussions, and uh, wish you many more in the future. And uh, so what I want to talk today about is um, an, an interesting algebraic structure that uh, I'm hoping to perhaps get you to be interested in. So this is kind of to some extent expository. Of course, I'm a representative of a, perhaps a different view of logic than many of you in doing categorical logic, category theory. So, um, uh, but I hope you won't uh, take that against me. I'll do the best I can to explain some of these ideas. Um, as clearly as uh, I can. So, um, traditional categorical logic or categorical proof theory, so this is sort of early Lovier and Lambeck in the 60s, uh, has the following idea. We're interested in modeling proofs. And so the idea is that formulas of a logic should be objects of a category. And uh, proofs should be arrows. So that if you have an entailment, A entails B, then that should determine a, a function, an arrow in a category, from its denotation of A to the denotation of B. This would include, for example, uh, uh, even if you take the pre-order reflection of a category, every category has a pre-order associated with it, you just put a less than or equal to there instead of an arrow. You say there exists, A is less than or equal to B if there exists an arrow from A to B. And that's always there. And that would be the, uh, uh, if you indeed have a category, then of course, uh, reflexivity gives you, uh, is given by the identity, and uh, transitivity is given by composition. So, so you really do get a pre-order, uh, and that would be, uh, in categorical logic, we tend to call that the uh, tarski lindenbaum level. And then, of course, you have the genuine uh, uh, proof theoretic level. But then, of course, you could keep going. If you're a serious category theorist, you have arrows between arrows between arrows between arrows. It goes all the way up. Um, but let me just look at a simpler level just of, um, at the higher level, you can have rewriting between proofs, cut elimination. And uh, the denotational semantics then uh, says, well, you get equal arrows. So you get an invariant of cut elimination. Not too interesting, because it doesn't explicitly talk about any dynamical information, but at least it's, it's something. And originally, the, uh, uh, my view at least, of Girard's uh, geometry of interaction program was to understand, find more meaningful invariants for cut elimination in a sort of a structured way. Um, but then it, uh, so if I want to look at things as a sequence with uh, 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 premises and conclusion, uh, a more dynamic way of looking at it is an I.O. box, where the input wires are labeled by the uh, inputs, uh, the premises, and the output wires are labeled by conclusions. And then we're going to be uh, joining uh, uh, boxes together in uh, networks. Um, there's a sort of framework that I want to uh, um, talk about here that's very common in lots of areas of mathematics, and uh, it's called uh, monoidal or tensor categories. But I want to talk about a very simple particular version of this. This is such a trivial version. All you have is uh, you have a, uh, a, a bifunctor tensor, and then all I do is just assume I have a monoid. It's just associative with a unit at both arrows and objects. Very simple. In fact, it's so simple that probably you're all saying, ah, he's got it wrong because most category books have millions of diagrams that these things have to satisfy. But that's not the case. In point of fact, McLean had a theorem called the coherence theorem that says every monoidal category is equivalent to a strict one. So this is without loss of generality. We can look at this. And it justifies graphical language rewriting, this kind of idea, because now we can look at graphs. Uh, so there is an arrow from uh, x times u, x tends to u, into y tends to u, and I write it this way. And then um, uh, composition is just joining, or cut, for those who are thinking already ahead of proofs, uh, uh, joining together these uh, uh, figures like this. And um, tensor, you just juxtapose them. And this is uh, now very, fairly common, these diagrammatic graphical reasoning languages. Um, for example, the identity is written as a straight line, and uh, here is a, just a simple observation that if I replace uh, F, F is the same as F composed of the identity, and G is the same as identity composed of G, and so I can sort of slide them along, you see, because they're up to equality, they're the same thing. 
just slide them sideways. And by the way, for those who are uh, looking at this, this is of course the same thing as F tensor identity followed by identity tensor G. So there's another equation here, right there. But this is a graphical language for talking about equations in tensor categories. Um, uh, a tensor category is called braided if you have a natural isomorphism from A tensor B to B tensor A. Natural just means if you perturb A and you perturb B, you have appropriate square commutes. And uh, if you do it twice and you get the identity, that's called a symmetry. And there's what it looks like. Uh, of course, if you happen to be using ribbons instead of wires, you're going to get twists when you do that. But, but let me stick to the, the planar case and uh, use wires. Um, Oh, there it is. For those of you who are feeling bad about not having diagrams, this is what it all looks like when you have a complicated diagrams. Well, let's ignore that. So, trace model categories is a fundamental structure that was what I want to talk about now. It was introduced by Joël Street and Verity uh, in 96. It was actually in the early 90s. It's a new fundamental structure in mathematics. It's an, a category, a tensor category with abstract trace with braidings and twists. So it has its origins in algebraic topology and in knot theory, and it's interpretable in many, many contexts as feedback, parameterized fixed points, Markov trace, braid closure. Uh, in the paper, they also make the little observation. They say, oh, by the way, uh, this is what GOI is, all, <laughs> is GOI is all about. So they make these, these various side remarks, and um, it's suitable, I would claim it's suitable anywhere you have algebras of networks with feedback which makes sense in physics, biology, um, uh, hybrid systems, other kind of areas that you need. There's control theory, for example. Um, so, uh, however, there's another story here because independently computer scientists have already discovered this. Um, there's a long history in, in computer science starting with Calvin uh, Elgott in uh, flowchart theory, Bainbridge, Arbid Manus, Blumessig, Stefanescu, very interesting. He completely discovered and wrote a book on network algebra where he discovered trace model categories about 10 or 15 years before Joel Street and Verity and even proved some of the fundamental representation theorems of freely generated ones. Very nice uh, stuff, very hard to read, uh, very bad notation, but, but excellent ideas. And um, so this is an interesting idea. So what is it all about? What is this trace thing? So it's, it's an operator which takes arrows from x tends to u to y tends to u and gives you an arrow from x to y. So here's an arrow from x tends to u to y tends to u and how do you get an arrow from x to y? Well you do feedback. And now we want to demand that, that, that this feedback should be have a nice uh, sort of homomorphic properties. If you perturb x, an appropriate thing should happen. If you perturb y, now here's a variable u which category theorists would say is contravariantness and a covariant here, or uh, logicians would say it's a negative variable here and a positive variable here. What kind of equation would you write for that? And then you can ask other questions. What if u is u1 tensor u, u2? What if f is f tensor g? What kind of properties should this preserve? Which I'll talk about in a second. Later I want to talk about, uh, in fact, the main purpose of today's talk is not so much trace, but partial traces. We might demand this operator here is not always a total operator, but just partial. It's only defined on certain arrows, those arrows being the domain, and those are called the trace class maps. Uh, but even more a special case, ah, okay, I'm, uh, I don't think I can go back. This, I'm sorry that I, oh yes, I think I can, I did. Okay, uh, suppose we set uh, x and y to be i. Then uh, i times u, remember, is already u in a strict case i times u is u, and then we go into i, i. So what is that? Well, what happened there? Now I'm going backwards. Yes. Oh, I moved the mouse back. Oh, thank you. Sorry about the technical problems here. So, um, uh, what is CII there? What is, what is that thing? This is called the monoid of scalars. It's the endomorphism monoid of the unit element in any uh, monoidal category. I'm only interested in symmetric monoidal categories. And uh, what this thing is called then is this trace, in this case, is called a scalar value trace. Why are these things called scalars? Think of linear algebra. Take vector spaces. Tensor means tensor. 
What is the unit of the tensor? It's the base field. So this is all the linear maps in the base field to itself. Those are one by one matrices, those are scalar. So that's why it's called scalar value trace. And it turns out to always be commutative, it's a general theorem. So, fine. Uh, what are kind of equations? I don't want to uh, give a giant course in, in the model category theory, but I'll just quickly tell you some of the equations that might happen. If you perturb x here a little bit, well, you want to, you can slide the loop around. You can just make the feedback bigger. And uh, similarly on the y. The, uh, uh, in the case when um, the u is positive and negative, what you can do is slide this whole thing around. This is called dinaturality. And it says the trace of a product is the trace kind of in the opposite order. But you know that from linear algebra. Trace of a, b is trace of b. So, um, the next one I want to talk, uh, this is the most interesting by far. What happens when u is a product? This is a feedback on a product is iterated feedback. And don't forget u tensor v is symmetric. So this says it doesn't, if you want to compute, this is also called a Beckage property in, feed, in um, fixed point theory. And uh, so that means then that um, it doesn't really matter uh, uh, how we, whether we compute it on the u first or the v first, that will give you u tensor v. If you translate the, into this into the language of proof theory, uh, in the cut algebra, this is a, what Girard would call the associativity of the cut. In fact, this is uh, the analog of the church rosser theorem for cut elimination okay, in the algebraic form. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip some of these. Okay, this is the most fun. You have uh, the, the flip map here, and you, you go around and you yank it like a string, and you get the identity. Okay, that's an axiom. So the trace of the symmetry is the identity. Of course, in non-planar cases, you're going to get ribbons and twists and braids and other things. But yeah. Now, here's a nice one. By the way, this one now, uh, I'm not going to give you a full a proof of it, but you can give a proof. If you try to give an algebraic proof, you will spend five days trying to figure out the, the proof. It's very hard, but diagrammatically, it's trivial. Take this thing, yank it. What do you get? You get F followed by G. So it says that the trace of uh, um, F tensor G uh, uh, composed with symmetry is G composed with F. This has lots and lots of implications. Let me just mention a few. Um, first of all, notice what it says. So the proof theorists should like this. General composition is definable in trace mode category. General composition is definable from basic compositions together with some tensors and some flips and feedback. Push a cut up, what's a general cut? You don't eliminate cuts, not from the point of view of categorical logic. You push them up to the leaves, and then there may be some basic cuts and some equations. And this says this process of feedback is, is, is what's going on. Another uh, 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 point of view is that this also gives you a, a, a normal form, rather like the cleaning normal form, that says in an arbitrary freely generated trace category, uh, uh, compositions can be written in this normal form with one global feedback on the outside. Finally, uh, for those who have been following, there's some recent uh, development in the last five or six years in Oxford of Abramsky and Kuka have a whole school of um, quantum, uh, finite dimensional quantum mechanics developed in uh, various kinds of monoidal categories, so-called dagger compact categories. And um, this, and what they've been doing is showing how to code into their language, their graphical language, various quantum protocols, teleportation and other things. This is exactly the key step that's used in most of their protocols. This is uh, generalized yanking, it's called. So this is, this is nice, interesting. Uh, there's lots of applications, symmetric trace model categories in the literature, in computer science, for example. There's, uh, as I just mentioned, in quantum programming languages, uh, or quantum protocols, Bradsky, Cook, uh, and Peter Selinger's work in quantum programming languages uses trace mode categories all the time. Plotkin, unfortunately, mostly unpublished, but many lectures he's given on uh, these kind of ideas in uh, uh, biology. Uh, attribute grammars, and there's a whole school in Japan, uh, Hase Hasegawa, studying uh, uh, feedback and uh, these trace mode categories. Uh, there's many others, relational data flow, uh, concurrency theory, Miller's action calculator written in terms of this. Uh, and of course, my own interest was from Jurat's geometry of interaction program, although I should say he doesn't approve of any of this category theory stuff. But anyway, that's a difference. So the, uh, traces have two kinds, and ultimately I want to talk about partial rather than total. 
But the two kinds are, um, uh, well, Bramsky uh, provocatively calls them wave style and particle style. But what they really mean in mathematically is it depends whether your tensor is like a Cartesian product or whether it's like a disjoint union. That's all. And uh, when it's a Cartesian product, then uh, we think of the, uh, uh, this gives models for parallel computation and data flow. Whereas where it's disjoint union, you have these networks and you have particles flying through the network. So these trace models are iterative, or what Dennis calls path-based computing. So this is uh, 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 two different views. Uh, there's not much known about how to compare the two. There's something called Bainbridge duality, an ancient classical technique, but uh, it's not, uh, not a complete in there. But let me just uh, uh, give a little uh, plug here. Peter Sanger has a beautiful, absolutely beautiful paper called Survey of Graphical Languages in Minoidal Categories where he talks, uh, gives these graphical languages, proves completeness theorems for them, that they're, that they're adequate and, and, uh, for proving all kinds of uh, theorems, coherence theorems and everything. And he talks about the fact that what, what's really the difference, the difference with the particle style, that's where you have disjoint union, is that you have a generic while loop. And uh, in the other, you have a fixed point of a process. And so this is the difference between data flow and control flow. Uh, he talks a little bit about Bainbridge duality, but I won't mention that now. But it's a, it's a, a very interesting viewpoint that's now naturally in the categorical setting. Uh, Girard had to prove, for example, uh, associativity of the cut. It took, in Girard's original paper, Jump to Interaction, four or five pages to prove it because he didn't have the axiomatization. Now we sort of take it as an axiom. It's almost immediate in, in one step. So th this is a very uh, nice notion. Uh, so the product or wave style, I, I won't have time to talk about them, except a finite dimensional vector spaces in, are included. So ordinary trace on matrices, that's an example. Uh, for those domain theorists in the audience, omega CPL, so you take the category of complete partial orders, uh, sending chains of uh, countable soups, uh, countable chains have suprema, morphisms preserve those. Uh, that's the standard model for domain theory. Uh, the, a trace is given by the least fixed point combinator. And in fact, Alex Simpson has classified all those domains for which the uh, fixed point combinators are traces in our sense. But I want, oh, and uh, for those of you who happen to like uh, 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 feedback equations, and this, this will arose uh, uh, in later work, which I'll mention of Plotkin, uh, when you have feedback equations, and if you have any model in which you could set the variables here on the left-hand side equal to the u's on the right-hand side, any place where that's true, that gives you a trace. Satisfying all the axes. So, particle style traces. The model that one of our favorite models in uh, categorical logic is called REL. So, it's the category of sets and relations. Very simple category. Objects are sets, maps are relations, binary relations between the sets. Composition is relational problem. Okay, very nice. Uh, in this category, if you have a relation from x plus u, so the tensor now is disjoint union of sets, if you have a relation from x plus u to y plus u, you can write it as a matrix. You can look at the pairs which, from x, which x relate to y, the ones where x goes to u, u goes to y, u goes to u. So imagine particles flying in this network, and either they go straight out, or they come down, they cycle some finite number of times, and then they fly out. So then the trace is given by this, which is obviously related to transitive closure, you push this thing through, you get R star, and the equations of a trace turn out to be some strange but interesting equations in cleaning algebras. Known, but just from a slightly different point of view here, a little bizarre. Uh, you can do the same thing, it has nothing to do with REL. Uh, I mean, it has nothing explicitly to do with REL because you can do it with subcategories of REL. The one I happen to like is uh, partial functions and partial injective functions. Partial injective, let me stick to that because I uh, just had a colleague come to visit from uh, UK does inverse semigroups, and so he's convinced me that this is uh, the way to do things. Partial injective maps. So look at partial injective maps. You get exactly the same idea, the same sort of a formula of expanding out particles, trace around and fly out, once I tell you what that means. And what does it mean for uh, a bunch of, uh, uh, a family of maps to be summable? I'm going to say it has disjoint domains and codomains. In that case, you can write out what the sum is. The sum of an element x is, well, it's somewhere in the input, and then you just apply the, that component to that function. Yeah. Works, no problem. Uh, so uh, this, these are just a few of many. There are many, many more. Uh, oh, uh, 
let me, for lots of time, let me just skip this. Uh, there are versions of the L2 functor, which takes partial injective maps to Hilbert spaces. This is where Geroid's original geometry of interaction took place, but my claim is you don't need to know anything about that. It's just, it all occurs in partial injective maps, of course. Um, you can do stochastic relations, which is a famous uh, uh, model of probabilistic computing, but I'm going to skip that. Ah, Peter Salinger's quantum computing, so you have completely positive maps or super operators. These are all traced categories. Very nice to work with. So, oh, and yes, traditional uh, while loop semantics, the Elgott dagger. The Elgott dagger, uh, the usual way of uh, Blumen Essig and uh, Elgott, studied the uh, processes where you, particles come in here, cycle around, and eventually fly out. And uh, this is called the Elgott dagger. And um, these correspond also to uh, trace operators. So all of the analysis that was done in the old computer science literature fits here. There's a theorem of Joao Street Verity. I probably don't have time to, too much to talk about this. But it's kind of interesting uh, mathematically. It says that any trace of a noidal category can be embedded into a category with a universal property. And this is like constructing the integers from the natural numbers. It's also the fundamental part of the K0 group when you, when you do that in the, in the um, Grothny group. So it's just all you do, it, it's kind of an interesting construction. And the point is that the integers here have a trace, a canonical trace, because this is what's called a compact category. I don't think I, I don't think I want to talk about this. So let me let me skip this for now. But just to say that any trace category can be embedded into a category, which is built in the in the manner that you get the, the natural numbers from the uh, the z from the natural numbers. It's the same manner, and that has a compact trace. And the main theorem of the paper of Joao Street Verity is that any trace category gets a trace that's induced from this canonical tree. And so that's why, in fact, the, the trace in vector spaces and the trace in relations under times is the canonical trace when you look at it in this formalism. But that's, that's perhaps, I'll skip that. But what I want to talk about is partially traced categories. And this is um, an interesting uh, uh, subject. This is when that operator, remember that trace operator, is partial. So now the trace is not defined on all maps, but only defined on a subset of the arrows from x times u into y times u. I'm not going to assume that they are necessarily have nice, as nice of properties as some in the literature. The first paper here was Abramsky, Blut, and Parangadin, where they looked at trace and nuclear ideals in tensor star categories. And this was uh, used in, understand in physics, actually. They were interested in certain kind of trying to understand Hilbert Schmidt maps in, in physics. And uh, with an aim at ultimately aiming to apply it in uh, quantum uh, computing. But um, it's a nice paper, but the kind of domains that I'm going to be looking at, which arise in a natural way that I'll tell you about, don't actually, um, are not ideals in this sense. But there are many other theories. But the main one, which is totally unpublished, the thing that got me interested in the whole subject was a brilliant talk by Gordon Plotkin at MFPS in Montreal in 2003. And he was interested in so-called Conway ideals on uh, byproduct categories, partial trace theory, recursion ideals. And he developed a whole huge program for how to um, model lots of notions of computing based on partial traces. He never published this because he never quite was convinced he had the right axioms. Um, and so I think uh, what I say is we, we eventually, a student of mine, as far as Verdi and I got, we think, the right axioms and I think Gordon agreed. So uh, we wrote a paper called Towards a Tight Geometry of Interaction, and it gives a local version of George GUI, which for now doesn't matter, but it had an interesting new class of traced categories. And recently, Peter Selinger and, uh, uh, and I have a student uh, where uh, Octavio Maler, and he studied partially traced categories. We have a paper coming out on that. It's now out in the Journal of Pure and Applied Algebra. And I wanted to talk about this idea. So remember before the picture. This is what a trace is. It's an operator which takes arrows from x tends to u to y tends to u and traces around. But now we're going to demand, perhaps, that it only be partial. It's not necessarily always defined. 
And so what we do is we say, okay, it's a partial function. I don't know why. I put an arrow there to say it's a partial function, but in fact it's total on its domain. And this t here, t here, is the domain. This is the domain where this trace operator is defined. And that's called a trace class. Okay. And the maps that satisfy this will be trace class maps. And these are uh, uh, interesting. Uh, we need to have some equations, what these equations should satisfy. And so what you do is, this is actually, uh, next one, right here. Uh, this is difficult because you need, now things are only partially defined. And all those equations that I had before about um, uh, traces, now you have to put in Kleene equality, or Kleene inequality directed cleaning equality. And you have to put them in all over the place. And so sometimes it works nicely. So this is uh, naturality just says H trace of F composed with G. Um, cleaning equality goes to this. So that's not too bad. And dinaturality just says that one side is defined if and only if the other side is defined if so they're equal. That seems, everything you know, seems fairly natural. Until you get to Beckage. This is a strange one. Remember that what we're trying to say is trace of a product is the trace of a trace. And so you read it this following strange way. You say, if this inside part is defined, then the whole right-hand side is defined if and only if the left-hand side is defined and they're equal. So it's a conditional cleaning equality. So it says, if this thing here is defined, then conditional cleaning equality. And the trace of the symmetry is always equal to the uh, identity. So this is what I'll call a partial trace. And there are many examples of this that are interesting, and I'll start with some non-examples. So the first example you might imagine, you would say is, oh, okay, let's look at um, vector spaces, ordinary old vector spaces, although this will, same analysis will work in abelian categories and other things. Take vector spaces and uh, put an appropriate topology so that I can write the sum, that infinite sum, and it makes sense. Just take the weakest topology where that makes sense. And just write it out. There is there is what that, that sum is. And I'll call that the uh, cleaning trace. And you take the uh, uh, another one. Uh, maybe I might want to put this on the outside instead of on the inside. Oh, so fine. These are two different first guesses that this would be a partial trace. Um, no. Unfortunately, this is not a partial trace. Beckage fails. Okay. So you do the next best thing. You say, all right, well, maybe if I use, uh, you know, from... Um, uh, undergraduate combinatorics, you use a little bit of generating functions. Instead of having the summation of f to the n, you write it 1 over 1 minus f, right? So I write, uh, um, and so uh, summation of x to the n is 1 over 1 minus x, if, if the appropriate matrix norm is true. So let's try that one. And that works. I'm going to say that a partial trace, and we got this, by the way, from reading the, uh, uh, this is S1, and I got this from reading the, um, uh, the hybrid systems literature, actually. This seems to be a fairly uh, uh, s uh, standard idea. I'm going to say f is trace class, if it's the right shape, if i minus f22, that means i minus the 22 block, if you write it as a block matrix, is invertible. Why should it be invertible? Well, I don't know, maybe the matrix norm of f22 is less than 1, or maybe f22 is uh, nilpotent. Then you can write out the expansion and it dies out. So no problem. Anyway, for whatever reason, if f22 is, is, is um, if i minus f22 is invertible, then I write that trace exactly what we had before. And if we can expand this out as a power series, we get the old cleaning trace. But now, it's something else. Identity is, and this thing is not trace class, because then that gives you zero, it's not invertible. So identity is not trace class. But nevertheless, uh, uh, this seems like a reasonable thing. And the theorem is, it does obey all the axioms that I have to partial trace. Uh, it's not so totally trivial. You get out your uh, handbook of linear algebra, you start looking through, and remember, uh, being trace class meant, meant that um, um, I minus F22 is invertible. So suppose you have a block matrix, and you want to know when that thing is invertible. Well, that thing is invertible if and only if we could say something about the 2-2 block. It says, M is invertible if and only if I minus BD minus 1C is invertible. And if, if D is invertible, if the 2-2 two, two block is invertible, then M is invertible if and only if that happens. 
And this is an area for which I discovered there are huge books called Sure Complement, and there's a bunch of books on this. And so it turns out the guys who do this linear algebra have already studied all these equations. I don't know where they thought of them, dinaturality, all these things. They had them already for 50 years. They had these equations. But anyway, this is a lemma, and you prove it. It's nice. And this one, remember, trace of AB is trace of <coughs> BA. And this setup says I minus AB is invertible if and only if I minus BA is invertible. Guess what? That's exactly a lemma. So then you prove that, and that those are used in verifying the uh, fact that you do get a partial trace in the sense that we just uh, mentioned. Uh, here's another example, a slightly stranger example. This is due to Malherbe. Uh, we can look at um, a map from V plus U into W plus U, and we're going to say in vector spaces, although this works in uh, Hilbert spaces, it works in many settings. Uh, the image of F21 is containing the image of I minus F22, and the kernel of I minus F22 is containing the kernel of F12. This has uh, uh, a lot of interesting feature. The identity is trace class with this. And then you take the trace as to be this funny thing. So you're kind of writing it across. Anyway, this is, um, this is a trace. It turns out this is quite hard to prove, but you can, you can prove it. I mean, it's messy, not hard, messy to prove. You can prove it. And uh, this is called the image kernel trace. Uh, complete metric spaces, complete metric spaces and non-decreasing maps form an interesting category, very interesting category. In fact, this is one of the categories that Plotkin had suggested. He said, you should be able to do trace this, these kind of partial traces, and we should get a new foundation for analog computing. This is what he said in 2003. And we still haven't found this yet, but we hope this is the right structure. So complete metric spaces, and now this is a product style trace. This is not some style. And this is, uh, so I take Cartesian product of, uh, of metric spaces, uh, this is very easy to do, and uh, given a map from x times u to y times u, I'm going to, uh, which is, uh, I'm going to say it's trace class, if for every x, the induced map from x to y has a unique fixed point. Okay. I'm not saying it's a contraction. Okay. Contractions do not form a trace class. But, the defect, but, but contractions do have any fixed points, so at least this class is not empty. Okay, so that's a Bonnach fixed point. Okay, so good, this is trace class, and the theorem, and if, if that's the case, then trace of f from x to y is given by a simple formula. And uh, the uh, theorem is that this does form. You can verify uh, in, I think, the original paper with the best form, we verify that this does indeed form, satisfy all the axioms that I gave, partial trace. So these structures, oh, uh, I guess I have a lot more um, uh, here. So here's uh, stochastic relations um, as a finite stochastic relations. So before I looked at the category stochastic rel, or I mentioned it briefly, but if you make all the sigma algebras finite Boolean algebras and you unwind what it all means, it means you just look at matrices which are column stochastic. And you can then define trace class and, and trace, and it works all very nicely. Perfectly nice category. Um, uh, you can consider it as embedded in, uh, in a monoidal subcategory of finite dimensional vector spaces. You can consider it in various ways. So, I guess I'm going fast because, in fact, I'm almost at the end of my talk, but I'll, I'll see. Um, <laughs> let me uh, give the main theorem. I won't have any chance to, you, I'll invite you to look at the paper in Journal of Pure Implied Algebra to see how this works. But this is quite a, a an interesting theorem, I think, in some ways. So this is in Malherbe's thesis, but we've given a general version of it now. Suppose you have a, a, a partially traced. I want to know, how can I classify the partial traces? This is my question. How can I classify any partial trace that occurs in my system? So you, here's the idea. First of all, I'll give you an algorithm for finding partial traces. Start with any category that's traced, either partially or totally. I don't care. Take any monoidal subcategory, and then I'm going to say, take a map downstairs from x tensor u into y tensor u. I need to compute its trace. Move upstairs. If and when that trace exists, it's an arrow from x to y. If that arrow from x to y lives downstairs, you're done. Okay, so theorem is that algorithm gives you a trace satisfying all our axioms. So that says, 
if uh, D, the subcategory, is partially traced by saying F in there is trace class, if you move it upstairs, if it's trace class upstairs, and the trace lives downstairs. The second theorem is that's all there is. Every partial trace arises this way from a totally traced ambient category. Okay, so this completely characterizes these traces. Um, now, this uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the proof, but the proof is that it is actually a partial version of that I mentioned in passing that Joel Street Verity int construction. But because now everything is partial, you need partial categories, so you have to go through uh, Freud's theory of paracategories. It's a very uh, involved proof, but it's uh, interesting. But now we can ask a very natural question. This enveloping category, of which any traced category, its, its trace arises as restriction of this enveloping category, um, it's just a purely formal thing. It's a free construction. It's very complicated. What about a real construction? Can we, uh, that uh, HS trace that I mentioned, the very first trace, I minus F22 is invertible in vector spaces, what's the ambient category there which gives you that trace? No idea. In the, in the, however, the kernel image trace, the answer is yes. Uh, we look at rel on vector spaces, and this is a new result that uh, a student of uh, Girard just uh, sent me last week. Uh, you use a rel on vector spaces, Mark Vagnol proved this, that you do get an ambient uh, category which contains vector spaces, and such that when you restrict its trace, you get down that kernel image trace. That so sometimes you can do it. Metric space is no idea. Okay. So, um, Oh, you, all of this stuff, by the way, works also for uh, Selinger's categories in quantum programming languages, completely positive maps. You just say I minus F22 is not only invertible, but also completely positive. Then again, that gets you a trace. And again, it's a restrict one of these restriction traces. So that's pretty good. It works also for Selinger's super operator category. So this is nice. There's a meta theorem. Any equation that follows from the laws of totally traced categories also holds in partially traced categories, provided that is defined at all. This even holds in the presence of additional strict axioms. In particular, reasoning in the graphical language is sound for proving equalities of arrows in partially traced categories, provided they're defined, even if the intermediate steps are undefined. So this is a corollary of the synthetic theorem. So, so it's kind of a, of a, of a conservativity result. Um, I have four minutes. Maybe I'll say what geometry of interaction is, and, uh, or I could, I could stop. But I'll just briefly say what categorical GUI is. Um, this is where the theory arose. The theory arose in the following way, that you have a, a, a proof, and you have a set of cuts associated to the proof. And Gerard wrote, in those days, this was long ago, when he first started, wrote his proofs with a list of cuts attached to the proof. And associated to this proof is this kind of feedback along the list of cuts, and that's called the execution form. However, this particular one is just a trace. It's not Girard's, it's ours. Categorical execution. Theorem disagrees with all the Girard execution formulas, at least for GUI 1 to 3. Uh, in Hilbert spaces and all the others. I have no idea how to make sense of his current ones using von Neumann algebras, but perhaps it applies to that as well, I don't know. Um, and uh, just to show you how it works in these languages, uh, the idea is that you have a notion of orthogonality. We say f is orthogonal to g if gf is trace class. And so f is orthogonal to g in vector spaces if i minus gf is invertible. And in metric spaces, f is orthogonal g if gf has a unique fixed point. And then types for Girard, in, in this framework, formulas are types. What are types? They're sets equal to their biorthogonal. So this is a standard thing. And how do you interpret proofs? Here's a typical interpretation of cut. So take cut, and notice here is the list of cut formulas you have. And at the last step, you, put, you make a stack, and you put these little cuts on the stack. You cut formulas. And so what you do is you, you interpret this in the following way. You tensor the two proofs together, which means you disjoint union. You just stick one on top of another. And then you rearrange the interface so that all the cuts are now stacked at the bottom. That's our stack discipline. And so that means you conjugate by permutation. 
And all you're doing is changing the interface. You're not doing anything to improve. <laughs> GUI doesn't do anything. It just changes the interface. That's how cuts interpret. And so I'll end with a, a theorem. Then, uh, so if you do logic, say multiplicative exponential linear logic in this setting, you get the following. You get that this proof here is a partial symmetry, if you understand that in the general sense of um, operator algebras. Proofs as algorithms. So Girard, in his early work, was interested in trying to understand uh, Yanis's theory of algorithms. And so uh, he gave, as part of his GOI framework, a theory of algorithms associated with that, which he claimed was a kind of analog in his setting of Yanis's work. And so the point is that the meaning of a proof is an algorithm of its type. And that tells you that the execution formula converges and lives in the type. And in particular, the execution formula exists. And indeed, the execution formula is an invariant of cut elimination. But now, this is the original problem I said, now this invariant has more information. Now it talks about dynamics before it did. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, I, <laughs> thank you for much. If you, if I, well, I, I have some privileges of asking stupid questions. <laughs> I remember the good old times when uh, I was sitting in the uh, some stick office, and um, there were people who were studying real mathematics around, but not all the logic. There are people studying brain groups. Yes. And uh, in brain groups, there are some there are some diagrams with a nice looking. Absolutely. Groups. Absolutely. And also, there, there was an algebraic theory, which yes. is Markov, which is now here. Yes. With all the uh, well, with, well, defining relations and all the. the, 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 the. And uh, uh, I got a feeling that the, 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 the talks are delivered with errors, whereas the proofs are delivered by with formulas. Is it still the case here? Because I see right, which, so which comes first. Well, what is the status of all these arrows? What's the status of algebraic? Right, right, right. So, so uh, I don't have the quote here in front of me, but in Joao Street of Verity, they have this beautiful paragraph that says that um, you, exactly the, that, that you can never understand the proofs that are done algebraically. They're so complicated and they're traced braided categories. They said you can only visualize what's going on uh, with the diagrams. But you need to prove a proper theorem, a co coherence theorem that says that it's sound to reason with these things. So that's that paper I mentioned of Selinger's gives very careful proofs of all of these things. So it's still the same way. It's you, still the you, same you, way. You, you, prove a, you have yes. to first prove a theorem, a big theorem. That you vision with arrows, but you prove with forms. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but once you, you've, you've proven the theorem, then you, that justifies it, then you don't, no longer have to use the algebra. That's the point. Use geometry. Yeah. Uh, when you constructed that enclosing trace C, was that like a completion? Or a yes, yes. It satisfies a universal property. It's the compact, so for those who know technical words, it's a compact closed category that's a completion of the original trace mode category. It has a universal property. And in particular, there's an embedding of the original trace category into this int completion. And that int completion has its own canonical trace. And this trace is induced from that one. And what, what we're doing in the partial world was exactly the partial version of that, but it turned out to be much more complicated because you needed partial categories. And so this is an adjunction between partial and non-partial? Yes. Having been a person who worked in feedback for 50 years, uh, the only important, the pictures play almost no role <coughs> in the actual subject. The actual subject consists of decomposing a, uh, a uh, feedback problem described mathematically into bits and pieces such that each of them, such that they can be reassembled and then checking for some mathematical reason which isn't reflected in any of this stuff as to why you have stability. Mm -hmm. So the fundamental features of feedback just aren't there. You have the pictures right. of them without it. Pretending that somehow by magic the thing actually operates according to the rules you've got on the board which it doesn't unless there's a stability in the system. Right, well, so this is... talking about actual... Yeah, I mean, this is the uh, algebra... This is part of the algebra feedback rather than the, uh, you know, the operator analysis, uh, which, which needs... Well, I, you know, so so this doesn't capture everything. The I mean, operators you have there 
And those formulas you have for the last 50 years of algebra, you know, both of the, uh, a lot of that is for quantum mechanics and actual circuits. Good, but that, that's some of these things monotone. I'm sorry? So you have monotonicity, a lot of the stability problems go away. You're, you're thinking of situations where you get non-monotonicity, and so you can get uh, oscillations and so on. Oh, yeah. So, but in your case, a lot of that stuff that you were showing, uh, it automatically was stable because it was, not, was monotone. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm certainly not claiming we're getting the full theory of feedback, but, but uh, it's, it's a You could have asked that just as well. Yeah. I oh, know, because of his background. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, who would think this is good?